Uh, I'm very excited. I adore Joan. And, um, you know, I think we're just going to see what happens. I kind of like to pretend like that we've just been married for a long time and just, this is just part of our routine. So we'll see how that goes. Hi, I'm Joan Rivers. As you can see, the name of the show, In Bed with Joan. Let's get right to it. Let's see who's coming out of the closet today. Hello? Come on out. Ah, Chris Hardwick. Hey, Chris I was Hardwick. just in your closet oh. for like a week. <laughs> there is so much poop in there. There's so many people there you can make deals with. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> They're all dead. Okay, so it's great to have you here. It's That's very exciting one. to be here, Joan. Yeah, well, not very exciting. No, it's pretty exciting. It's, it's just nice to see you. It's pretty exciting. And it's going to be a short, very short, uh, interview because you now own an empire, so I just want to know how'd you get it, and do you want a partner? And that's it. <laughs> the answer is no. Out of the bed. We're sharing a bed. We might as well share a Everything. media company as that's... well, right? Did you ever see this happening? No, no, no. I just got. Well, you know, you've worked in the business for a while. You know that you. A you, while. You sort of feel like it. You sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother wasn't born when I started. <laughs> No, she. I'd say she was. I'd say she was. I, I listen. I, I just. You sort of feel like you get kicked around like a soccer ball in the entertainment business. And at a certain point, I decided, well, I'm not getting jobs that I don't even want, and I'm still feeling bad about them. Yeah. So I'm at least, if I'm not going to make money, I'm at least going to pursue things that I like and not make money. And then that ended up becoming my career. You and, know. But the Nerdist. Yes. Which is an empire. How did it start? Like the Kardashians, we know it was a. She was on all fours. Yeah, yeah, I got fucked and by Ray J. You got. And then, uh, and I, then I was like, I should do something with something video games. I yeah. have begged Melissa. <laughs> I thought it was a joystick. It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, you know, I, I, I just had, I don't know. I, I, there was a job I was up for, and I thought I was going to get it, and I didn't get it, and, and it happened a million times. Uh -huh. And finally, I woke up one morning and I said, I'm only going to work on things I care about. Um, you know, I love video games, sci-fi, comic books, anything. So I'm just it's science. I'm just going to work in those areas. And I'm also a comedian, and I have all this hosting experience. So what can I do with that? And that 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 kind of started it. And what did you do with that? What was the first thing you did with it? I, I started a website. Um, but nobody cares. Know, Do you know what a, I mean? Yeah. It's like every my my neighbor has a of course Bernice Goldberg, BerniceGoldberg dot com. Look her up. Fascinating <laughs> recipes. I mean, it's like <laughs> she's making windowsill pies again. Oh, you'll oh, love Bernice. them. Trust me, your man will come home. <laughs> and it's like, cobbler, it's cobbler. <laughs> oh, it's cobbler Thursdays, Bernice. Um, so. Yeah, I, you know, as soon as I kind of made this decision that I'm only going to work on things I love, this weirdly this opportunity came up to work for Wired magazine. Um, ah. And so I started working for Wired and doing a TV show for Wired on PBS. And it just sort of led to all these other opportunities. And then from there, what are there female nerds? What yeah. are they called, like nerdettes? No, no, it's just, it's just nerds, geeks, you know, it's all the same thing. It's a, Nerd culture is so much a part of our culture now 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 it is so when i was younger you had to seek it out and you had to be and if you because you had to seek it out and spend a lot of money on it you were you really had to love it right and now you know everyone's got you have a phone in your pocket that is the sum total of human knowledge accessible to you at any time so that you can go on and tell other people to go fuck themselves right, right. um but it, but at the time you know you had to build a computer you had to you know it was different. Because now I, uh, you look at Big Bang Theory and uh, Mark Zuckerberg, all these people are yeah. nerds. Nerds and are billionaires, yeah. There was a nerds certain, are billionaires. There was a certain politics that came with it that, like, I always said the nerds make the shiny things that distract the mouth breathers. Yeah. So the nerds would sort of, <laughs> that's why the nerds came into power is because they were making video games and technology and sci-fi movies and these are all the things that kind of power, all the non-Kardashian spheres of our culture. But you understand all this. I am, and I'm in it. And I have my Twitter and my Twatter and my Tutor and I have everything going on my Facebook and the whole thing. But uh, things like YouTube channel and uh, premium YouTube. And, yes. And my agent tries to explain it to me and I just glaze. <laughs> well, it's sort of hard because, you know, what, what a comedian, I mean, this whole time, you know, I've been a stand-up for 16 years. and But 
it, you really now can't just be a performer. You have to be an industry now. You have to be your own marketer. You have to be your own content creator. You have to be your own promoter. Like you have to do everything, or you or you die, basically. Right. Right. So it's a, it's just sort of a different. But you know, I really like that because it gives us power. I do, I st- being a stand up is like seizing your career and. The next step up from that is, you know, all, making all the digital stuff yourself as well to get your comedy out in the world. Do you still do stand up? Yeah, yeah, I do stand up as much as I can get on the road. Yeah, see, uh, it makes me feel terrible. Yeah, it's hard. It, it's hard because I. It's hard when you're busy. It's hard when you're busy, but you really do. It is the thing that I love the most, and I'm probably 11 months away from shooting another hour special, so I really need to. You know, I'm just, I've just started announcing dates now, and I got it. There's the only way to write comedy is to be on stage. Kathy Griffin, who's my friend, every 12 minutes she's got another special. Louis, Louis C.K. does a special every year. I couldn't, I couldn't do it that way. George Collin, but he, all he did was that. Yeah. And he would sit and write the next one, and then the next one. Uh, but the minute you do it, you've given away the whole act. It's done. Yeah, the minute you do it. So, I, so you got to, you got to start all over again. It's a is, whole different way to do comedy. I like to. I think it takes, for me, it takes about a year to sort of figure out what it is that I want the hour to be. And then it takes another year to like tighten all the screws and make sure that all of the dick and vagina jokes are... Are, cl- are and, clever. Yeah, exactly. Do, do you get that a lot? Uh, are you dirty? I said, no, there's a point to my vagina jokes. <laughs> when I talk about... <laughs> When I talk about putting jewelry on my clitoris, I'm doing this. Are you dirty? No, my vagina is very clean. Very clean. Oh, that tells you everything you need to know. I, I mean, yeah, I always feel bad because the first place my brain goes is to the pants. And right. I, I always feel like, come on, man, what are you doing? You know, but it's, I don't know what it is. I'm, I've never evolved past my 15-year-old self. Which, but neither has your audience. No, I guess that's Thank true. God. That's true. What about when you see, I love when they say, well, uh, do you work clean? I always love that. Do you work clean? I was taken to the... Republican National Convention. They were worried about me, and one of the chairman's wives showed me a ring where two people were fucking. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> that woman's name was Shirley Temple. Oh, <laughs> did you mourn when she died? I felt a great loss in the Force. Yes, I felt a, I felt a ripple in the Matrix when uh, Shirley Temple. I think Shirley Temple Black. Shirley Temple was one of those people where you were like. She was alive? Oh, shit. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I guess I have to go through this sadness twice because I feel like I went through it like 20 years ago. But, you know. Uh, do you find there's certain people you can do jokes about the minute they die and there's certain people you can't? They're absolutely, you know, it's sort of like taking the cultural temperature of like, what's okay? How did the person die? What did, what did they contribute to the world? If they were kind of an asshole, it's probably, you know, but if they were someone beloved, you have to be a little careful. But then on the other hand, you know, you kind of, comedy always sort of dances around what you should and shouldn't say. Yeah, you know, I, I, I end my act by saying that uh, Whitney Houston was a very good friend and I was there when she died. Mm-hmm. And her last words to me were, <laughs> <laughs> And half the audience laughs, and half the audience stands up, not for an ovation, going check. <laughs> but I get that standing ovation. Who gives well, a- Hey, listen, that's why you save it for the end of the show. Yeah. Oh, I- they were going to leave. They probably wanted to get to the ballet sooner, <laughs> get their car. Goodbye, good luck. Yeah, you yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's well, it's interesting because my my dad died pretty suddenly in November, and uh. three days three days after the funeral, I went on stage and I just started talking about it, and so it's been really interesting to actually talk about death and find like what is this shared human experience we have about death that we can make funny and so it's kind of my dad by dying almost gave me this great gift by all these great new jokes about death that have kind of gravity and meaning oh every night i say to edgar thank you for committing suicide it opened opened doors i never thought about before <laughs> the most unselfish thing that oh, happened. Oh, God yeah. bless him, you know? Either that or dying in Auschwitz. One of the two, those are equal for, <laughs> right, sure, for really sure. good humor. Sure, yeah, of course. <laughs> but I think it. But I think it's good to, you know, what I try to remind people is like, hey, it's okay to talk about this stuff because comedy kind of gives us power over the things that scare us. But, we have to laugh at things to get over them. Well, when I was in New York during uh, 9-11, mm-hmm. or as I always called it, 7-11, because that's where I was. Oh, sure. So <laughs> <laughs> had my own meaning for me. But, um, uh, and I began to do jokes that night. 
Yeah. Because that's how I get over it. And half the audience would write me notes and say thank you. And the other half would be terribly offended. Sure, Too sure. Bad. Yeah, I mean, it just sort of, you know, you really can say whatever you want as a comic, and then it just becomes this formula of like, how much backlash do I really want to? I mean, for me, I don't, I, I don't like, I don't like when people get bummed out. Like, I want the show to be fun. I want everyone to have a good time. So, I tend to keep the jokes about me and my life so that no one could ever say, "How could you?" I'd be like, "Well, fuck you. I went through this. You can't tell me. You know, it's my dad who died." Yeah, but don't you always? I just make it up. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, and I was with this crippled person. Uh, my sister was crippled. And I... <laughs> <laughs> that's that's your disclaimer. That, that totally <laughs> covers you. Yeah. That's your legal disclaimer. Well, the fun thing for me now is that when I talk about some of the dad stuff and people get a little squeamish about it, I go, you're dishonoring his memory by not laughing. You know that you were dishonoring my dead father's memory. <laughs> and it just sort of like loosens up the room and everyone is like, oh, okay, we can, it's okay to laugh about it. And of course you can laugh. He was a pedophile. I mean, it's, it's all right to laugh. <laughs> I mean, you really, it, it, people need that kind of release. Like, they really do need to know that everything's okay, and I feel like that's what comedy should do. I, can I just ask you one question? Anything. Because um, this whole thing, like, you remember when the business where someone had to tell you whether or not you could work, whether or not you could come on a show. Yes, still how, for me. How did it feel to go back on The Tonight Show? Uh, now we're getting serious. Yeah. Uh, the Tonight Show, I was banned, as you know, yeah. for 20-odd years. Mm -hmm. Carson banned me, which was... Stupid, yeah, you I know, moron. I know, I know. You drunken wife beating allegedly moron. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. You drunken wife beating moron. Um, uh, banned me because I left the show. And then Leno, that asshole, uh, continued the ban. What? And continued the ban for his entire period. And it wasn't that we didn't ask. My agent would go on his knees and beg. And my agent once said to him, People commit murder. And they're out in 20 years. Oh, put him on the show. <laughs> Wouldn't put me on the show. And then Jimmy Fallon came. And the first call I got, they said, would you like to come back to The Tonight Show? Oh, that's so Is that great. great. Well, Jimmy, you know, he's a huge fan great. of comedy. He's doing a great job. And, and I've loved, I've always done The Late Show with him. Yeah. And he said, come back to where you belong. It was really fun to see you back on yeah, there. Yeah, it was such a moment for me. And it was 46 years to the time I first come on the show. Oh, my gosh. By mistake. Oh my Isn't gosh, that that's incredible. February 17th, someone said to me, you know, it's 46 years of the day you first went on the show. So it really meant a lot to me. Well, nice, nice work. And I got to uh, kiss uh, Mariah Carey. <laughs> Lady Gaga called me Stephanie. Uh, what? I mean, yeah, I mean, people think they know you. Oh, and oh, And you're gotcha. standing backstage. Uh, Will Smith comes over and gives me a hug. I'm going, I don't know. What the fuck is going on here? But this is terrific. Well, you're all part of the Famous People Club. Yeah, but they all come over and talk like we know each other. Yeah, but that's kind of nice, right? Oh, it's fabulous. Who do you want to still meet? Um, Bill Murray. <gasps> really yeah. want to meet Bill Murray. Loved, I was so sad that Harold Ramis died. Loved Harold yeah, Ramis. Yeah, Doesn't that kill you? Wouldn't you like to write a fan letter and say, just meet me for 10 minutes? Yeah. Well, I met Harold Ramis in like the late 90s, and he was just, like the nicest guy ever. And I, and I always thought, oh, I want to get him back on the podcast. Or Bill. But Bill Murray's like this weird phantom that just appears if you summon him, and you, but you never know if it's going to work or not. But he just lives, he lives this really weird lifestyle now. But wouldn't you like to... Who else? All right, Bill Murray... And give me a woman. Who would you like to meet as a woman? Uh, well, you were actually a big thing for me on the podcast. I'm not kidding. You were a big thing for me on the podcast. That shows you how sad you like this. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Like that was a big. That was a big moment for me. Just from being, you know, like a, a lifelong comedy nerd. We're changing the subject totally. Okay. You stopped drinking at 23. No, I stopped drinking at I stopped drinking at 31. 31. I stopped 31. drinking uh, 11 years ago. Why? Because <laughs> I was... Yeah, why were you drinking that much? Or did you just say, I'm allergic or... <laughs> I'm, I'm allergic to being sober at the <laughs> yeah. time. Uh, yeah, no, I was drinking a shit ton. And I think uh, there are these kind of moments where you have where, you know, you sort of fall into a pattern. And um, I would wake up in the morning and I was so hungover that I would drink a beer to feel better and kind of catch myself in the mirror and go... I don't think you're supposed to be doing this. And then right. just sort of, I knew. And my career was kind of dead, and I was chubby and unhappy. And so I guess I thought, well, I can either continue down this path, or I can refocus some of this energy on getting my career back. And then in retrospect, I realized, like, oh, I have all these emotional problems I need to figure out. Right. And did you? I did. Well, I figured out a lot enough, of them. Enough. Enough. Yeah, yeah. But aren't you scared if you're really happy, you won't be funny? No, I'm not actually. I don't. Oh. I don't subscribe to that. I. I, oh. I really. I find that I'm funnier. I mean, I write 
I write a lot if I'm pissed off about something, but in general, I'm funnier when I'm happier. Because I'm comfortable and I feel good, and you know, and, and that just, that's how my comedy uh, stuff gets activated. And are you happy now? What's your private life? Uh, well, I've had a same. I've had a girlfriend for two and a half years, and um, and she's great, and we spend as much time together as we can because we both work a lot. Is she in the business? She is in the business. She does a very similar thing to what I do. She kind of reviews video games and does a lot of stuff online, and she's she's great. So there's something to talk talk about. She's great, yeah. And her father is like, her father did the special effects for Star Wars. Like he's one of the biggest oh. special effects guys in the film business, and. That's not why I'm dating her, but it, well. it was a it, it was a checkbox to find like John Dykstra's daughter. Like for, for Christmas about a year about a year ago, he gave me a three by three chunk of the original Death Star from Star Wars, oh. which was sort of like nerd dowry for for his right, daughter. Right, right, right. So I, uh, you know, it, that we just have a lot of the same loves. Okay, now we do something very special on this show. Oh, what are we gonna do? Yeah. Oh, this is exciting. Okay. We have two special sections. <laughs> All right. Yes. Get ready. Everybody in their life has done something to someone where they're sorry about it. Okay. And we are going to give you the opportunity to look at that camera and apologize to someone using their name. <laughs> I, Chris Hardwick, would like to apologize to my church for masturbating in the bathroom there when I was an altar boy. <laughs> I wanted to see what would happen. I wanted to see what would happen. It was, a it was for science. It was an experiment. I thought, if this is wrong, God will surely strike me down. And he didn't. I walked out unscathed. I didn't do it again. It wasn't a habit. I'm not, we're not going there. Okay, good. If, whatever you did again, you did again. Yeah. We can have you back. You can do it second. Another, is it all right to apologize to an institution? <laughs> <laughs> it's a first. <laughs> and now comes the opposite. The opposite comes of someone that was not nice to you. That you could say, look where I am. And we call that sit on it and rotate. This, this did just happen was a girl I had a crush on. So this girl... Name, I had, name. Her name was Michelle Carter. I had a crush on this girl in grade school. Uh, it was in eighth grade. We were at a party playing spin the bottle. And you refused to kiss me in front of everyone. In retrospect, it probably helped my comedy development because it made me go home and uh, turn inward. But um, but recently, she already kind of reached out to me on Facebook and was like, hey, how have you been? And I'm like, oh, I have to let this go now. You can sit on it and rotate. But thank you. Rotate gently because you apologized to me, and I appreciate that. So I hope it's an enjoyable rotation. I just was going there. <laughs> what a pleasure to have it's you It's good to on. see you, Joe. Oh, my, oh God, my God, I adore you. you. It is so, so good mutual. to see you. Would, we always ask our guests, would you end the show by doing the clapper? Sure. If you were? Okay, so Chris Hardwick, would you end the show for us? I would be honored. That's wrong. I'm sorry, Michelle. Good enough. I love you. I'll do it. On, off, down. All right, that's enough. Okay. This was better than I thought. I mean, I knew it was going to be great, but I highly recommend if you ever have the opportunity to get in bed with Joan, you should absolutely do it. And if not, then you just hate awesome things and you should go fuck yourself. Hey, Joan's shoe. Can you turn that off so I can be alone with the shoe? I am so thrilled that Chris Hardworth was actually on the show because he is so busy. He's got podcasts and TV shows and after shows. He is busier than Robin Thicke's penis. Let me know who you'd like to see in bed with me. You can do it by sending me a message on Facebook or Twitter. <laughs>